Closed captioning of this program is made possible by the Fireman's Fund Foundation. Tonight, California's high-speed rail gets a multi-billion dollar boost from the president. The push for diversity on the Citizens Commission to redraw election district lines. The Prop 8 trial wraps up with dramatic testimony and tracking stimulus money for a project in Napa. Then how to prepare your home for an earthquake. So what you do is you take a piece of steel and you attach the floor framing to the top of the cripple wall so now it can't remove. Check Please Bay Area Leslie Shabaco host a new segment on local food trends and a story about keeping artistic dreams alive in Oakland School for the Arts. That's all coming up. Good evening, I'm Belva Davis and welcome to the first one hour edition of This Week in Northern California. We begin with our news panel. Joining me are Tom Baker, consumer editor for KTVU News on high speed rail funding. Scott Schaefer, host the California Report on KQED Public Radio on Proposition 8 trial. John Wildermuth, writer with Fox and Hounds Daily on the Redistricting Commission. And Lance Williams, senior reporter with California Watch on the use of stimulus funds for a project in Napa. Tom Baker, we begin with you. The $2.25 billion that California is going to get from President, uh, from President Obama sounds like really good news. Now, that means that California is getting about a quarter of all the money that's being distributed nationally. Mm -hmm. Why? <laughs> Need, power, and patronage. <laughs> That's easily the easiest way to put it. It is obviously something California and many other states need, and many other states are participating in this. Certainly power, California is uh, a very important state politically, always will be. And finally, uh, patronage. We are a big accounts receivable to uh, many p political p uh, people, and as a result, they feel they have to do this, and obviously we're a very important state. Having said all of that, the idea is to provide a down payment, two and a quarter billion dollars. That allows from Prop 8, 1A funds that were passed a couple of years ago for us to go out and get another equal amount of money. So now we're getting kind of in the $5 billion range, but it's a down payment on a $40 billion project. 520 uh, miles of rail that will initially go from San Francisco to Anaheim, so basically SF to LA. Uh, ultimately, it will then be expanded uh, all the way to Sacramento and San Diego, and then maybe some spurs off of that. But the idea is to try to create a high-speed rail system that will be competitive with, obviously, the airline industry, but also try to create a, a great new transportation system within California that should result in lots of jobs. Tom, the president made a big deal about shovel-ready projects. Uh, are there going to be any shovels and dirt turning <laughs> as a result of this money? Well, that's what's really interesting. The, uh, the conditions of this are very, very clear. You actually have to start building this thing by September 2012. If not, you don't get the money. And it has to be accomplished very much quickly after that. Uh, 2017 is the target date. It could be as late as uh, uh, 2020 for the uh, primary thing. But when you think about what we're talking about, the span, the scope, and all of this stuff, this is an enormous public works project, probably the biggest ever in the state of California, and one of the biggest in the history of the United States. So as a result, it is a very, very powerful uh, incentive to do this, or you lose the money. Are they going to call this like tracks to nowhere? I mean, it's not going <laughs> to hook up with anything. Uh, well, it is eventually going to hook up with something. That's going to be two major metropolitan areas, but how you do that at the ends and all of the problems getting to those ends, not so much in the middle of the state where the right of way is there and pretty easy, but when you start getting in these urban areas, you're going to see some fights the likes of which we haven't seen in a long time. Well, one of the things is that, uh, you know, even after the state passed the $9.9 .9 $9 billion bond measure, you've heard a lot of people in Sacramento saying, well, we can't sell those bonds. The state really can't afford to do this. Getting this money from the uh, feds, two and, two and a quarter million, $2.3 billion, this really means there's not a lot you can say in Sacramento except let's go, right? Well, the problem is, of course, the state has the worst credit rating in the nation, so whatever we do in selling bonds and raising this money, we're going to pay through the teeth for it. But let me talk to you about the jobs because I think that's what's really interesting because that seems to be the thing on everybody's mind. 
It's, it is estimated that there will be 160,000 construction jobs that come from this, 34,000 of them alone from the San Francisco-San Jose route. Just in that piece of territory, there will be 34,000 jobs. And if all goes as planned, it'll be 450,000 permanent jobs after construction. That is a big number of jobs in the state of California. Now, with all of the, the joy around getting this uh, two billion plus amount, the governor asked for even more than that, didn't he? Yeah, he wanted twice that amount of money because he figured he could double down. He's got $9 billion in this Prop 1A, so he could have gotten all of that money, and that would go a long way to do this. But remember, we're talking about a $30 to $40 billion project, so funding it, making sure we have the funds, how we're going to do the funding mechanism, how much private money might have to come into this, all of these things are undecided. And then there are other really major issues. For example, a lot of people in the peninsula, while they support very much the idea of high-speed rail, don't want it above ground. You put it underground, it gets a lot more expensive, a lot more complicated. All of these things still have to be worked out. So if we really want this money, if we really want to do this project, we have to decide pretty quick. You said private money might come in. What give, do you have a sense of where what, what that might look like? Who knows? Uh, it might be something as simple as a bond, you know, a private guys coming in buying certain kinds of bonds. Maybe special bonds would be created. It's not really clear how all of that's going to happen, but there's an impetus that happens here. Once you get this thing going and people see that it's working, then they will be excited about doing that in the chance to make money. The other problem that really threatens this is the inability, the continuing, nagging, unfailing inability of this state to get its financial house in order. That could hurt this project more than anything because people are going to say, do, why do I want to even buy these bonds if these people aren't going to figure out how to do their budgets? That is a real threat here. And again, the good news for Californians, the average Joe Californian, the, the, the you and me's of the world who say, why can't they make a decision? If they don't make this decision, we're going to lose that money. Yeah. Tom, well, is there a prospect for money for the so-called rail box in downtown San Francisco? There's, 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 there's a chance to raise money for all of these things because Ultimately, it could all be integrated. So there is going to be money available for those kinds of things. Exactly where it comes from is still unknown. The primary goal here is to get this project started, to start laying tracks, to start electrifying things, to do all the things that you need to do. And if that alone happens, then there's going to be a lot of uh, benefit here to the Bay Area. Now, the airlines are not going to sit on their hands either. Undoubtedly, this is a big threat to them while all this is happening. It has the potential to be a big threat to them, provided that people take the train. That's the other problem with this, is that public transit, train transit, there's very little of it in the world that isn't publicly subsidized, and there's no reason to believe that this is going to make it on its own. There's no way it can make it on its own, given these prices. So there will be public subsidies, but the airlines will have something to compete with, and all of us could benefit from that. How we will benefit will really have a lot to do with how much the public supports it and how much they actually use the system. Yeah, okay, well, at the, at the same time that you're talking about good news coming there, you're in the beginning of a real process that could bring reality to the dream of the train. Uh, we're midways, another story, Scott, that you're covering, and that is uh, the Proposition 8 trial that's been going on here in federal court. It's reached a stop point right now, uh, not the end, but a pause. So what there was dramatic testimony this week from the defense. Can you tell us a bit about that? Yep, this is uh, the defense. They're defending Proposition 8 uh, against this uh, challenge, uh, saying that uh, from plaintiffs saying that uh, Prop 8 is unconstitutional based on the U.S. Constitution. No trial has ever challenged a same-sex marriage ban on that basis. And this week, there were only two uh, witnesses that the defense called uh, throughout the whole trial, and uh, both of them were on the stand this week. Probably the most contentious, the most interesting in some ways was uh, David Blankenhorn, who's the president of the Institute for American Values. And his point, he was like the star witness for them in a way, and his whole uh, testimony was focused on the reason for marriage. Why do we have marriage? Looking back historically over centuries and cultures and what is the, what would be the implications of uh, changing the definition of marriage to allow same-sex couples. And his fundamental premise was that uh, marriage is intended primarily to nurture bonds between biological mothers and fathers and their children. And that uh, same-sex marriage simply can't do that because you don't have two biological parents. David Boys, who is the attorney, one of the attorneys uh, for uh, the plaintiffs, uh, gave a very withering cross-examination of him and got him to 
uh, acknowledge a number of things which were very helpful to the plaintiffs, including the fact that uh, gay couples and their children would benefit from, uh, from gay marriage, uh, as well as uh, the fact that he, in previous writings, seemed to endorse the idea of same-sex marriage. So there was some, uh, some good give and take, but it was, uh, it was very dramatic, and, uh, and you really got a sense of David Boies, who was one of these two high-profile attorneys, where, why he makes the money he does. He is, uh, he is dogged and very, uh, very tough. And he was a surprise attorney for this trial. Well, one of the reasons this trial has gotten so much attention is because of these two attorneys. David Boies and uh, Ted Olson were on opposite sides of the Bush v. Gore case in 2000 that uh, Olson won for uh, the Republicans, helping making uh, the President Bush the winner of that election. So they're coming together now to fight Proposition 8 to support gay marriage. And uh, he was on the cover of Newsweek uh, last week, I believe it was, uh, Ted Olson, talking about the conservative case for marriage. So it's kind of a, yeah, unlikely political bedfellow, strange bedfellows kind of a story that's added a lot of drama to the trial. Well, one of the things uh, that the uh, the people uh, challenging Prop 8 are trying to do is don't they have to show that, that uh, gay should be a protected group? That uh, they're trying to say that there's no, that the gay community doesn't have power. And isn't that a tough thing to do in California, at least? Well, one of the witnesses this week uh, was Kenneth Miller, the other defense witness. And his purpose for being there was to show how much power the gay community has. And they pointed, in fact, to Proposition 8. The gay community and their allies raised uh, $43 million to defeat Prop 8. They failed, but, you know, a powerless group, he said, could hardly pull together the resources to uh, to raise that much money. But on cross-examination, he also acknowledged that throughout the country, you know, the gay community has been the target of a lot of uh, probably more uh, ballot measures than any other group in the country over the past uh, couple of decades to take rights away. Uh, and so they kind of battled it out on that front. But to your point, they one of the issues that they're trying to, one of the, one of the grounds on which this could be thrown out would be if, like the state Supreme Court, Judge Vaughn Walker, the federal judge in this case, decides that gays uh, and lesbians should be protected, that sexual orientation should be protected the way race, gender, and religion are also protected by the 14th Amendment of the U.S. Constitution. That's a reach. Um, and it doesn't have to be struck down on that basis. It could also be, he could also decide that it was just discriminatory, uh, that it was uh, it was rooted in discrimin discrimination and bias. They put a lot of uh, information into, uh, into evidence showing uh, uh, the messages that were given to voters that were very much based on prejudice and stereotypes. So it's a, it's a, it's a Vaughn Walker, if he rules in favor of the plaintiffs, ha has to know that this is going to go up on appeal almost immediately. And so if he writes a decision, some are saying that the best decision would be very narrow, a narrow decision that would be harder to strike down. And what happens next? Where are we? Well, uh, there's a sort of a 30-day timeout. Uh, both sides have 30 days to uh, submit more documents to the court. There'll be some more uh, uh, amicus briefs, amicus briefs submitted by friends, although uh, the judge himself said, I don't know if we really need any more information. Uh, but 30-day timeout, and then he'll just set closing arguments probably for some time in late March, early April. And is this when he reviews those videotapes? <laughs> He's going to look at the videotapes uh, after the closing <laughs> arguments, yes, okay. exactly. Thank you, Scott. Sure. Well, that was one proposition, Proposition 8, but now we turn to another proposition, Proposition 11, that the voters also passed that creates a Citizens Commission to draw the district lines for our state legislature. Um, well, the application process is supposed to be open, it's supposed to be encouraging, but something has not worked. What? Well, what the, one of their main concerns right now is that uh, they're getting lots of people uh, putting their applications in. It's heading on to 8,000 people but they are really, really short of people of color. I mean, basically three quarters of the people that have actually submitted their applications are white. I mean, for example, the 37% of the population is Latino in California, and only about 9% of uh, the people who submitted applications for this commission are white. Asians, about 12%, they're about at about 4% right now. Blacks are pretty much uh, equal to what their representation is in the state. but overall the question is you got 8,000 people they want more representation they want more minority representation but at the end of the day we're talking about 14 slots let's go back on the Latinos 37 percent in the population but only nine percent about nine percent have, have, have really uh, have applied gone, gone. and the application procedure is really easy uh, mm -hmm. it's uh, just online and basically you don't have much information to put in your name, and then you have to answer some questions. Have you ever uh, won an elective office? Have you ever worked for a politician? 
Have you belonged to the same party for the last five years? And if all that stuff is fine, that's then not, you're just on the list. It, it's not easy. <laughs> you're talking about some first generation f families here. Mm -hmm. So to say you voted in the last, whatever, five elections? Two of the last three Two statewide of the last elections. Three, and that you, what was the other requirement? Uh, other that requirement is that you or your wife or your kids haven't worked for a politician, haven't contributed more than I think $2,200 uh, in a year to a politician or a political campaign. No, I'm sorry. Go ahead. The, uh, those numbers you talked about are actually very similar to the electorate. I mean, California is a majority minority state, and yet the electorate is about 70% white. So it's a similar kind of a problem is who's involved in the political process in California. It's not a very diverse, it certainly isn't as diverse as the population uh, as a whole. No, and that's, you know, one of the problems. I mean, it's one thing to say, you know, Latinos are 37% of the population, but you're right, they're not 37% of the voting po typical voting population. But at the end of the day, what's gonna happen is there's gonna be 8,000 or more, and then the state auditor general is just gonna kinda cut this down to 60. 20 Republicans, 20 Democrats, and 20 declined a state or others. And then through a magical process, which uh, is gonna be back and forth, We'll end up with a uh, commission that has five Republicans, five Democrats, and four declined state and or other parties. And probably uh, 200 lawsuits all along the yeah. line. Well, exactly. you're already starting to see this because uh, the, some uh, people supported by the Democratic Party are already uh, working on a uh, ballot measure that would say, this can never represent the state of California, so let's just toss it out and let the legislature do it all over again. But to Tom's point, uh, are, are there lawsuits being filed already to, you know, sort of preempt all this and or toss it out if it doesn't reflect the state? I mean, on what basis could it's, they do that? You can always, well, the, the law itself says it should reflect the state, but it doesn't set any hard and fast guidelines for what reflects the state. But, you know, can you <laughs> file a lawsuit? Sure, if you have a filing fee, you can always file a lawsuit. <laughs> but you really can't file much yet because nothing's happened yet. Uh, until February 12th, when the application time actually closes, we really don't know how it's going to turn out. John, John, stepping back, are you optimistic that we're going to have a fairer and a better redistricting process? And are we going to have a legislature that can actually get some traction on our problems, or is this just... There's, there's no guarantees about that. I mean, the whole idea of, one of the ideas of changing this was to make uh, it more competitive. The idea being that, you know, a seat with a Republican and a Democrat fighting out, there has to be a middle ground and people uh, from the extremes are less likely to win. But the problem is, is that much of the, uh, much of the way that the state is set up politically is just by where people decide to move. You can do whatever you want, but you're not gonna be able to create a Republican seat in the Bay Area. You're probably not gonna be able to get many Democratic seats in the Orange County, Riverside, or San Bernardino. There's just nothing you can do. It might make it fair, it certainly will take the politics out where a Democratic legislature decides we're gonna line this up so the Democrats win, but it's not gonna be perfect. It's the possible solution recognizing that this, this whole idea of districting is probably impossible, and that maybe what really should happen is that everybody should run for state government at large? You, that, just think of the cost, it, more than anything else. If I'm uh, an assemblyman from Reading, and I'm gonna have to run a campaign attracting people from uh, LA and San Diego, you know, it just isn't gonna happen. What are these 14 people going to do? I mean, how long is it, how long a process is it? They have to move to Sacramento for a period of time? It's going to be, uh, they're probably going to have meetings around the state, and they're going to be paid, I think, on a daily basis, so, many, so much per meeting. But it's going to be pretty much a full-time job. What they are going to do is they're going to make the decisions. They're not going to be out there on a table drawing lines. They're going to hire pros to actually do that. But when the decisions come down and the decisions have to be made, it's going to be, they're going to say, this is the one we like, this is the one we don't like. And they will, who will decide who the pros will be that they will hire? It's a good uh, question. That's a good question. But they're going to serve for how long? Actually, their uh, terms are 10 years. Uh, but realistically, 99% of their uh, job is going to be done by September 2011. Okay, one, uh, what seemed like a simple choice on the ballot turned out to be more complicated as usual than Always. things are. Lance, your story also seemed like pretty simple and straightforward when we first heard about it from some pretty high-profile people in Washington, but uh, not that simple. 
Um, can you tell me this story is about the Napa wine train getting stimulus money? Uh, did the wine train get stimulus money? If not, who did? There's a flood control project, Belva. Uh, people in Napa have a need for protection against the wintertime flooding. The Corps of Engineers has an innovative design. And uh, uh, the toughest part of the job is relocating a bunch of infrastructure in downtown Napa that is used by the Napa Valley Wine Train, a private business and a popular tourist attraction. That's what the $54 million in stimulus funding is, is going to. You know, at California Watch, uh, the Center for Investigative Reporting uh, project where I work, we were looking at stimulus funding and, and how this contract came to be let. Previous phases of this flood control project were put out to competitive bid. You guys know experts say that's a, a way to control costs. But for this phase, the Corps of Engineers sought out a corporation whose shareholders are up uh, in the outback of western Alaska. They're called an Alaska Native Corporation. And under federal law to oh, uh, uh, right the wrongs of the past, they have special access to federal contracts, including the ability to get uh, unlimited size federal contracts without competitive bidding. Who was it that said we need, we, need a, uh, we need to hire a company from the Alaskan outback to do this? I mean, how does that happen? Well, the Corps explains that uh, if you want to get something done fast, you want to negotiate a contract with a sole source company. And most minority contracting firms are capped in the size of a, a contract they can get, but the ANCs, as they're called, the Alaskan Natives, don't have a cap. That was a measure that Senator Ted Stevens uh, implemented uh, over the years when he was representing Alaska. Before he was indicted. Yeah, well, his career ends in a contracting scandal. Uh, anyway, just I hope you get a chance to see the story on the California Watch website and in the Chronicle. It's really a story about uh, how federal contracts actually are led, and maybe it's also a story about how uh, even well-intentioned programs and uh, really good projects can wind up costing taxpayers a fortune. Lance's but the idea was to widen the channel so that the debris doesn't mount up and, and flood the area, which has been flooded year after year, time after time, and in recent years they've done these, these flood control projects that have helped a lot. I mean, the real idea here was not to service the wine train, but to widen the channel so that the, so that the flooding would stop. Well, the real idea is you're moving the bridges that the train uses, you're building a wall around their station. You have to do it because under the plan you're accommodating this business. Other businesses were eminent domain out of existence. They wanted to keep this one. So this is not stimulus money? Oh, it's it yeah, is stimulus $54 money. million. Dollars and, and so how many jobs money. are being created? Well, that's the thing. Uh, in the report that the Alaska Native Corporation filed with the federal government, they said they were creating 12 jobs. The flood control district says that's just a preliminary number, and they're going to do a lot better than that, maybe a couple of is, hundred jobs. Is the money being misused? Um, I don't think the money's being misused at all. I think the real questions and the appropriate questions are whether they're paying a premium uh, to go this route with a no-bid contract uh, in which sub, uh, subcontractors are doing like 65% of the actual work. So we start out with $54 million. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it goes out to bid. It ends up in Alaska. And then who runs the whole, who's running the whole project? Well, the CEO is a former dot-com and entrepreneur who lives in South Carolina. He doesn't actually have construction experience. Uh, the company hasn't ever done a big project like this. So it is subbed out to really good, solid uh, uh, local contractors. You know, we talked to a contractor, actually, who had... Uh, uh, done a prior phase of the uh, flood control project and got a design award. He's uh, convinced that by not putting it out to bid, they, uh, uh, it cost us an arm and a leg. So, This was one of the hundred or so projects that John McCain and Senator Coburn from Oklahoma singled out as being boondoggles when they looked at the stimulus uh, uh, projects. It, does it deserve to be on that list, do you think? Well, it deserves scrutiny. The people in Napa were aggrieved by the criticism. They thought uh, if uh, the critics were suggesting that someone had written a check to the wine train, and of course that's not what's going on, but it's totally appropriate to scrutinize how we're spending this fortune. Yeah, $54 million. Uh, 
up in Napa someplace. <laughs> thank you so much. In fact, thanks to all of you. Thank you, Lawrence. Thank you very much, Scott, and to Tom and John. Now for some other new stories in the news this week. A new state law to reduce California's prison population by 6,500 over the next year took effect on Monday. Low-risk offenders, including those convicted of nonviolent crimes, won't have regular supervision by a parole officer and can reduce their sentences by participating in education and rehabilitation programs or working on firefighting crews. Officials say it will save taxpayers half a billion dollars a year, but critics believe public safety will be compromised. Suffering from the poor economy, San Francisco's Muni may make some of the deepest cuts in its history. A number of heavily used lines would run less often and late night service would be reduced with buses running once an hour. Just last year, Muni raised fares and cut services. Well, will she or won't she? Bay Area Congresswoman Jackie Speer is considering a run for state attorney general, the post currently held by Jerry Brown. A statewide poll of likely voters showed her ahead in the already crowded field of major candidates, including San Francisco District Attorney Kamala Harris. Coming up, a look at research on seismic safety, Leslie Shivako on food and wine this week, and how Oakland School for the Arts is defying the odds. Recently, I didn't want to go to college at all. The administration there at my high school right now, I feel like they're the reason why I'm actually really considering going to school. Well, as we've seen the devastation from the earthquake in Haiti over the last few weeks and felt the effect of tremors throughout Northern California, we're reminded of how vulnerable we are here in the Bay Area. Experts have analyzed 2,000 years of seismic activity along the East Bay Hayward Fault and determined that major earthquakes occur there on average every 140 years. The last major quake on that fault line was in 1868, 141 years ago. This story from KQED's Quest series explores how researchers are looking for ways to make living in earthquake country safer. A USGS study in 2008 concluded there is a 63% probability that a 6.7 or larger earthquake will occur in the next 30 years on one of the Bay Area's seven faults. So it's not a question of if, it's a question of when. Probably the most dangerous fault in the United States is the Hayward Fault right here in the Bay Area. And that's because it has the potential for very large earthquakes and it runs right through a very built up area. And when it goes off, the lives of seven million people who live and work in the Bay Area will change in a matter of seconds. It's something many residents would rather not think about. But geophysicists like Mary Lou Zoback do think about it every day. Roadways will be shut down. The soft, water-saturated, sandy deposits along the margin of the bay where we have airports, approaches to bridges, they're likely to liquefy, ripping apart the roads. So I think we can assume transportation networks will be completely disrupted and destroyed. Water will likely be shut down. There will be fires because gas lines will rupture. There won't be enough water to fight the fire. Power will be down. Communications will be down. And if that's not enough to get your attention, recent findings by the USGS indicate the Hayward Fault may connect with the Calaveras Fault, which runs east of downtown San Jose. The maximum earthquake we could have if the entire Hayward Fault ruptured is about magnitude 7.1. But then if you add an earthquake that would continue on to the Calaveras Fault, you could get a substantially larger earthquake, maybe about 7.4, which would have devastating impact across the region. To put that in perspective, the total economic damage after Hurricane Katrina was about $125 billion. Scientists are projecting more than $170 billion worth of damage from a magnitude 7 event on the Hayward Fault. And after the earth stops shaking, at least 200,000 people will be left homeless. 
I often say it'd be a lot like Katrina, but here we'd be speaking 150 languages as well. Howard Cook, owner of Bay Area Retrofit in Berkeley, is trying to avert at least some of this devastation by preaching the benefits of strengthening your home. And he's converting the masses, one foundation at a time. I'm going to explain what a cripple wall is. And if you imagine, here's the foundation of this house. The floor is up here. And in between, there's a wall. And these walls collapse in earthquakes. Imagine this is the floor of the house, probably weighs 80,000 pounds. And when it shakes back and forth, this cripple wall will collapse and the house will fall from its foundation. So when you put the piece of plywood on, it can no longer move. This is very, very strong. The only thing is, once you put the piece of plywood on, this can still shake on, on the foundation and it can slide off. So you have to bolt the bottom of this to the plywood, to the foundation. So as you can see, the floor of the house can still slide on top of the cripple wall. So what you do is you take a piece of steel and you attach the floor framing to the top of the cripple wall so now it can't remove. This is a complete retrofit. Probably 25% of the houses in the East Bay have been retrofitted and I would guess that 95% have been done incorrectly. For 15 years, Cook has lobbied local building departments and city governments to establish better retrofitting standards. There are no seismic retrofit codes that, that work. There are some guidelines but they don't apply to any of the houses we see. These old houses were built by Norwegians, by Spanish, by um, you, you know, different Europeans, and they're all done differently. And you just you have to understand how it works and you have to know what to do when you see it. The lack of effective retrofitting codes is certainly not due to a lack of knowledge or experience. In fact, engineers at UC Berkeley's Pacific Earthquake Engineering Research Center in Richmond have been testing buildings on their 20 by 20 foot shake table for decades. This is the place to go to see firsthand how the most severe seismic events will affect human designs. Uh, the unique thing about the uh, UC Berkeley shake table is it's a three axis shake table. So it can be uh, moved in three directions, not only translation, but also rotation. As a structural engineer at the lab, Khaled Masalam has been involved with shaking up a wide range of structures like brick walls, wooden buildings, and steel bridge piers. Most of the tests that we have done on the shaking table have led to improvement in the design. Uh, whether it's improvement in the design of components of a building, improvement of the design of entire structure by understanding how they behave, uh, and more importantly, improvement in the retrofit of the existing built environment. Scientists are understanding more and more about the Bay Area's seismic quirks and how to build structures that can cope with them. So for Tom Broker, the next step is getting the word out. Well, you know, preparing for an earthquake is really everyone's job. We can have a kit so that we can survive for three days after an earthquake. Government needs to do their job. They need to be prepared so they can respond to the earthquake. And if retrofitting, or leaving the state, aren't options, it's important to know there are still things that everyone can do. Think about organizing your neighborhood, secure items inside your house, get first aid training, and come up with an emergency plan for your family. How quickly we recover from the earthquake, it's really determined by how well we've planned in advance for the earthquake and how well we've prepared for it. And for more on earthquakes and the science behind them, visit kqed.org slash quest. Tonight, we introduce a new segment on our program, Food and Wine This Week, with Leslie Shabako, host of KQED's popular Check, Please! Bay Area. Leslie and her guests bring us the inside scoop on the Bay Area's food scene. Thanks, Belva. I'm so excited to be part of This Week in Northern California. Now, I'm here with food bloggers from KQED's Bay Area Bites. It's a blog where foodies and culinary professionals, with their ears to the ground, or terroir as we say in wine, rant and rave about the latest local food trends, events, restaurants, and recipes. Tonight, Stephanie Rosenbaum tells us about the emergence of a whole new army of food vendors and a new underground market. And Michael Procopio brings us a waiter's perspective on dining, 
service and making a living when the economy goes sour. Now to start, Michael, you're a popular waiter at, at a popular restaurant. Popular too, yes. <laughs> you're very popular. How has this economy affected you? Well, I'm, like you said, I work at a, at a popular place, so I'm lucky, we're busy. Mm -hmm. But what I notice is that a lot of the checks are down. People are coming in, they are sticking to appetizers, mm -hmm. or they're sharing a main course. Um, and that's fine, right. I think, but it does decrease our, um, our check averages and therefore our income. That's right. And, and actually, the San Francisco Restaurant Association says sales were down last year about overall 10%. Mm -hmm. That's so about right. So you're really yeah. seeing the effect of that when, when a group comes in and they're sharing, sharing dishes. Or they're just getting a glass of wine That's instead right. of a bottle, things like that. Definitely. And um, a lot of, a lot of buy, the the, buy the glass wines, um, the bottles that are being sold are... are less expensive. Right. They That's are. Right. It's about a 6 to 10% decrease as well last year in mm -hmm. terms of wine sales. Mm -hmm. So buy the glass programs are expanding. It's cheaper right. to go in and get a $12 glass of wine, wine than a right. $50 bottle of wine. Um, cheaper wine. So that, effect, that affects you, though, as a, as a waiter, as a server. Tell us how that works. I mean, where, are your, where do tips go? People don't often know that. Well, it, where I work, tips go all over the restaurant. Mm -hmm. um, as a server, I am responsible for my support staff. Mm -hmm. So. I'm tipping out, if I get, if I sell a thousand dollars in a night, I'm tipping at least thirty dollars um, to my busser, I've right. got ten dollars to my hostess, I tip out my food runner the same amount, the bartender gets more, I have a barista, and I have a stalker. Right. So a lot of times what's happening these days is people are cheating a little bit. Sort of, oh, I can save a little three dollars here or five dollars there on the tip. Um, and if that trend continues, it's, it's devastating okay. to servers. Um, and not just but, you, but, but everyone. Everybody. Everybody yeah. down the line. Right, yes. Right. But with the well, economy no. picking mm -hmm. up, though, with the economy picking up, don't you think that, that uh, restaurant sales will go up? I mean, it looks like the trend is starting to reverse itself. I hope There's so. light at the end of the tunnel? I think so. And one of the reasons why I think there is a light at the end of the tunnel are the business dinners that I mm. wait on. Mm. You, I'm seeing more private parties being booked right. by companies. I am seeing them splurging a little bit on wines. I see them relaxing. Right. Last year, financial institutions having, having dinner were kind of nervous little uptight affairs. And, and restaurant openings are actually going right. up as well. They may mm -hmm. not be the expensive, yeah. high overhead kind of restaurants, but rest, more and more restaurants are And that will up. always happen. I was looking at, I was looking at a, this laundry list of all the restaurants that have closed right. um, this year, which was incredibly depressing, but mm -hmm. I... You just need up, to drink more wine. Yeah, <laughs> cheers. cheers. <laughs> um, but I also realized as I was reading it, Something's going to pop up in their right. place. They mm -hmm. always do. This is a city that is a food city that's never going to change. So that's mm -hmm. the good news. Yeah. Well, chefs, waiters, and unemployed food lovers, because there are still many of them, <laughs> are turning to new and creative means of earning a living in food service. They're on the streets or underground. Stephanie, I want to talk to you about what an underground market actually is. Well, this was a new, really a new event for San Francisco. Um, a man called Issa Raven started it. Um, he did his first one in December, and it was very popular. And what it is is, I can only really describe it as kind of a glorified bake sale. Um, and the, the fun part with things other than with, baked the, goods. with things other than baked goods. Um, and he he got a lot of people who who don't sell their things otherwise. These are not things you can get in Buy Right or at Whole Foods. They're you know, all kinds of original things, um, acorn fudge and b really good beef jerky. And I was there selling things that are foraged. Things that are well, often foraged, acorns, yes. right? Or, or they're you know, lemons and grown in someone's backyard, or chocolate made from raw, you know, raw cacao beans. Um, all kind, you know, sweetened with agave syrup. All kinds of kind of interesting, interesting products um, that people are making. You know, cucumber marmalade. I mean, things that someone just sort of in, yeah, That's someone's just kind of invented. And because they don't have to sell 50 cases to Whole Foods, they can they can just make it, you know, make a little right. bit all the time. And it, and it looks like it gathers a group of like-minded people Absolutely. so that it becomes more of an event and Absolutely. Party. I mean, a lot of people were there with friends. They brought their babies. You know, everybody I found was talking and saying, oh, did you do that butchery class at Flatted Calf? Oh, I did one at Avedano's, and it was great. And, you know, there was a lot of people who, who had a, it was a real community event. It was and a lot was of like-minded people. And this was the first event, people. correct? Um, this, the first event was in December. The second one just happened um, last night. Second one, okay. 
okay. second one was so hugely popular. More to come. We're hoping. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Right. I mean, he said he wasn't expecting it, but he said he probably had at least four or five hundred people. And how do people find out about this? Because now with social media, it right. makes it very easy to say we're going to Twitter, you know, right. and tweet and let you know where this is. Right. Yeah. I think it was a combination of they got some adv good advanced press, um, but they also a lot of social media, a lot of people tweeting and then retweeting about it. Um, you know, Bay Area Bites, Bay of Bay Area Bites, of course, was on it. But I think right. also people found out about it the old-fashioned way, finding out about it from friends. A lot of people had a friend who was who was a vendor there, or had a friend who had a friend who was a vendor there. And you there. feel like a hipster. Right? And you yeah. feel yeah. like a hipster, absolutely. That's you know, right. you people really felt like they were kind of clued in. It's like you know, going to Burning Man when it first started. You know, as opposed to going last <laughs> well, year. And that's kind you of know? the same thing right. with this this other trend and, that I wanted right. to talk about, which is which is the street vendors. Right. And you know, mm -hmm. more of it's not just taco trucks anymore no, that are out there. No, not at all. It's creme brulee. Yeah. It's escargot. Right. It's yeah. Spencer yeah. on the go. Oh. Jay Spencer's right. got yeah, their, exactly. Their truck that that serves. It's the magic curry. You know, it's it's all it's all kinds of things, and I. I have think it's a lot of people who had other careers. You know, they were they were therapists, they were HR people, they right. were you know they did they did PR something like that, and now all of a sudden maybe they got laid off, and they said, well, everyone loves my soup. Why don't I try? Why don't it's I try a, to sell it? Why don't I try to sell it? And briefly, yeah. 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 I, I just I want to hit on foods. I mean, on food safety for that mm. because mm -hmm. um, we just want people to know that that they actually have to you know yeah. adhere to food safety standards. No, absolutely. And the Department of Health actually said that that um, they're getting actually 12 to 16 calls a day now about people who are interested in going finding out about the permitting process for a mobile food unit um, right. as opposed to. You know, they used to get a couple calls a week. Right. So it's actually really exploding, and they, the city, thankfully, is really trying to make it easier and streamline the permitting process so that people can can get into it, and, and it can be small business is, entrepreneurs. And because the, if they do, then they they the, the, the city makes sales tax, the city makes money <laughs> from permits and everything else, and the the public safety is is assured. And again, the message is. Be creative. Native. Try these He's, wonderful stands yeah, that you right. might see, and you mm -hmm. might discover something, something beautiful. Exactly, something right. you can't find otherwise. That's they're, right. they're kooky and they're <laughs> fun. Mm -hmm. Well, I want to thank you guys both for joining me. I wish we had more time. I know. Oh, <laughs> We've yeah. got so, so much. much to talk about. You can read more from Michael and Stephanie at kqed.org slash Bay Area Bites, or watch Check, Please, Bay Area at kqed.org slash Check, Please. Cheers, everyone. Cheers. Cheers. Until next time. It was thank fun. you. Thanks. Well, in a city challenged by a multitude of problems, Oakland School for the Arts demonstrates that the arts can help young people stay off the street and flourish in classrooms, on stage, and in recital halls. This intimate look at young aspiring artists and the teachers who guide them was produced by filmmaker Jenny Chu as a student at UC Berkeley's Graduate School of Journalism. Well, that's all for tonight. Remember, we will be with you every Friday night at 8 o'clock. Visit our website at kqed.org slash this week to watch complete episodes and segments, subscribe to our newsletter and podcast, and to comment on the program. I'm Belva Davis. Good night.
Major funding for Quest on This Week in Northern California is provided by the National Science Foundation, the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation, the Richard and Rhoda Goldman Foundation, and the Amgen Foundation. Additional support is provided by the following.